help. History is here to help. If you wondered if we need help, we do need help, and history can help. Um, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech at the noon block on a given Thursday. And uh, that's uh, uh, Sandy Schwartz. She's a special guest, and this is a continuation of a conversation we had a couple of weeks ago about the, um, the, you know, the transmission, if you will, of democracy from uh, ancient Athens to ancient Rome. She's a history professor in the classics, and she can help us. History is here to help. Hi, Sandy. Thank you for helping us. Hi, well, thank you for, for allowing me to help you. Um, so, <laughs> I want to ask uh, my transitional question. Uh, okay. In our last uh, discussion, we spoke about uh, Athens. It was very, very interesting to mm -hmm. hear how, how it all came together in Athens. And mm -hmm. somewhere along the line, it transitioned from Athens to uh, Rome. And I would like to know from you how that transition worked and what parts of the Athenian democracy were were passed over, uh, were you know carried over to Rome. What parts were not, um, and how and how ultimately that gave birth to a new kind of democracy in Rome, and ultimately you know the death of democracy in Athens. This is all a, a fabulous transition. We we can learn so much from both sides of it. So let me let me know about the transition, Sunday. Okay. So speaking about um, Athens, um, Athens. We have to like take the bigger picture of the Mediterranean world, mostly in the Eastern Mediterranean world. The Aegean Sea is where Athens uh, had it had grown its empire, uh, and uh, and then further towards the west uh, in Italy, um, there were other peoples who were beginning to settle around the Italian peninsula. Uh, one of the major groups that came into um, the Italian peninsula were the Etruscans. Uh, they were uh, from uh, some area in Turkey in the eastern part of the, the Mediterranean, and they came and they settled in Italy. Uh, Italy was populated by many different groups. Uh, some were like just tribal groups, uh, and others were more uh, organized and the Etruscans were really the first um, civilization in Italy, uh, and and we ha we don't have a lot of of writing from them, uh, but what we do get are 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 many of the forms of uh, religious religiosity. Um, they um, they uh, they. Um, uh, found a fertile field um, where they could, um, where the Etruscans could take over and expand their empire. And what happened was that uh, the Romans at that time uh, were also trying to carve out a space in Italy where they could, um, where they could. Uh, uh, try to extend their population. So a lot of what we talk about in the Mediterranean history and ancient history is very much about geography and demography. And uh, land is the uh, most important commodity uh, in, in the Mediterranean world. Okay, so I'm just going to head. This is a little bit uh, not as linear as Athens, but this, um, but uh, uh, the story of Rome uh, really um, made a mark on uh, what would happen uh, in the um, in the uh, middle area of the uh, Italian peninsula. Um, the Romans uh, uh, began to try to push away their enemies um, because there were many. Uh, peoples in in uh, Italy and um, people were uh, were fighting all the time, and they had different kinds of fighting. The Etruscans uh, were were able to absorb some of this uh, early um, Roman culture, and so during that period of time, when you see the um, the image that I have in back of me. Uh, this is an image of the um, the the uh, earliest um, uh, forefathers 
of Rome. And, and, and much of what the Romans found was, from ta was taken from it, uh, it, the Etruscans. Now the Etruscans are where it, uh, Tuscany is, <laughs> obviously today, that's where that's where mm, we're mm. Okay, so, um, so the Romans at first didn't have a real structure but the Etruscans kind of gave them a structure of, of uh, consolidating their society. And so in what happened was that the Romans began to try to take over other places in Italy. And that really uh, sparked a kind of, um, a, a new kind of um, existence for these little, you know, people who were living on hut, in huts on the hills of the rivers of Italy. Um, the, 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 um, the Romans began to um, take what the Etruscans gave them, and then they moved throughout the Italian peninsula. I mean, this, I might be getting too much in the weeds and just tell me if, if if you're not no, I, well, I, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I just am remembering that uh, Tuscany, uh, I guess, which was the Etruscans' home, is probably a yeah. hundred kilometers away from Rome. It's a, it's a distant place. It, it was there was a, a town on the Tiber River, where um, the Etruscans came to to this river, and and the the river Tiber. Um, had a, an island in it. So you could ford your cattle um, from uh, the, in Tuscany to uh, Rome. So it was a meeting place. It was a common denominator uh, among these two civilizations, uh, the Etruscans and the Romans. And so they met in, in the middle. And they traded and they exchanged ideas. And, um, and so the Romans then began to understand that they, they could probably create a, a, a city that, that, that they could have. So um, there are many myths about, uh, about the exchanges between um, the Etruscans and the Romans in the early period. Uh, Give us an idea what periods we're talking about. The, okay, the periods that we're talking about are about 600 BCE. Uh, and, but we do have um, the uh, stories of the historian Livy, who wrote about these um, incidents in, in early Roman history. One of the most important um, incidents in uh, early Roman history had to do with a Tarquinian king, that it was a king who, who was, his name was uh, Tarquinius Superbus, and he acted like a tyrant. Uh, and, and so um, he, he lorded it over the Romans, and then the Romans uh, broke away and, um, and claimed their freedom. Um, there are lots of stories about Livy, and Livy is, is a, was a very uh, um, melodramatic uh, 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 um, storyteller. And, and these stories um, were the basis of, of ancient Rome. One of the, one of the uh, signal um, events was when Tarquinius Superbus went to a dining party with his uh, fellow Romans. And at the dinner party, Tarquinius Superbus raped the, um, the host's wife. That's, now that's melodramatic. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> it's like, you can't, I mean, it's so great. It's so great. It's all soap opera. And, and the way that Livy tells it, he's just, out, he, he loves it. He loves the story. So anyway, so these, these so the Romans, uh, actually, I should say, I should backtrack that uh, Livy wrote these stories during the time of Julius 
Caesar or uh, Augustus Caesar. So the what you're seeing in the backdrop is from the Arapacus, and that is a creation of um, Augustus Caesar. And that was several, very hundred, several hundred years before. Huh? Right. So the 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 Romans um, had a motto saying that they never threw anything away. They kept all their traditions. The Romans were very, very traditional. Even the, what, what they brought from the Etruscans, um, they kept. Uh, so for example, the Romans would, would um, have, uh, they would have heruspects, <laughs> which are uh, diviners of looking at the livers of uh, sacrificial animals to, to get a sense of, you know, what the gods wanted. And, you know, that, was, that is part of the Roman consciousness of, um, of, of really um, looking towards the gods. Uh, so, so we have, so, so and, and actually in, um, if you go to Rome ever, there is a, the a Villa Giulia, in, which is a museum now, and you can see these model livers where the, the priests would go and look at the entrails of the, of the animals that were sacrificed. And, and you know, it's, it's kind of weird, you know, because when you think about um, you know, the Romans being, you know, upstanding, you know, uh, politicians, and they were, but they also had these kind of, um, these strange ideas. Okay, <laughs> so, so it's, it, but, you know, but people took these things very seriously. Um, there was the story of Romulus and Remus, the two brothers who fought against each other. Romulus uh, sat on one hill, Remus sat on the other hill, and Romulus came and killed his brother. So fat fratricide is another storyline for uh, Roman history. Um, okay, um, all right, do you have a question? Any questions? No, sure I do. Okay, <clears throat> so so yeah. here, you know, uh, last time we talked about these uh, polis, uh, P-O-L-I uh, Poli. type community, Poli. Poli, yeah. communities that were um, in the hills, the hills around Athens, um, and they developed a kind of a, a community uh, organization, a community a pre democracy, if you will, kind of community organization, and then it came together in Athens, and uh, presto, you know, we have democracy functioning. For the first time in the world among humanity that we right. know of, um, right. and it, it built it built an empire. Um, so, okay, some of that must have been transmitted uh, to Rome, um, mm -hmm. but I'm sure that Rome had its own process with the Etruscans and otherwise, where mm -hmm. uh, just as you say, they held on to everything. They never forgot anything, right. and they were taking little pieces of what was going on in the world around them and consolidating that into their own system, which turned out to be democratic. Can you talk about that? Okay, so, um, so what happened is that um, throughout the West, uh, Eastern Mediterranean, um, there were communities that were kind of uh, becoming, you know, the polis, the city-states. Um, there were, um, when, uh, so let's go back to 600 BCE. Uh, the population was growing iron was available, people could, uh, could use tools, um, stronger tools. Um, and so um, throughout the Eastern Mediterranean, um, there was communities uh, figured out that, that, they could, um, that they could organize themselves on the pattern that the Athenians had done. Um, some of the people who lived in Greece um, moved to Sicily. Uh, Sicily and um, southern Italy were um, populated um, around um, the Sicilian islands and southern Italy. Um, and why? Why did people go there? Because they because it looked like Greece. 
And in fact, if you go to Sicily, you will see some of the most magnificent and oldest Greek temples in Sicily. Hmm. Um, so, uh, and, and there are also Greek temples in, um, in, on the west coast of Italy as well. And, and Greeks, I mean, when, the, when, the, when there was a demographic explosion uh, with the advent of um, better agricultural tools and techniques, um, there were a lot more people who could get on a boat and go to Sicily. And, and that, that then created a, a, the, actually the, um, the name that the Romans gave to the Sicilian islands was called um, uh, Magna Graecia, which, is, which means a uh, bigger Greece. Mm -hmm. um, so so um, uh, Italy and Greece were very connected during the 600s. Okay, now let's go back to, um, to the, um, uh, <laughs> um, uh, what we were saying about um, democracy. Uh, there were um, uh, cities that grew up um, around southern Italy and Sicily. Uh, the, the Athenians had a war, um, uh, the Peloponnesian War uh, between uh, Athens and Sparta. Um, Athens um, went to Sicily to try to take over that island. Um, and then the Spartans came, their, um, their enemies um, came and, uh, and, 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 and destroyed the, the Athenian city. Mm -hmm. But Athens was very resilient. Um, and and there, were, there, were a there was a series of problems. There was a plague in, in Athens. Uh, so, um, so Athens was, was very resilient. Now the, the, the Greeks and the Romans who, who settled along the coastal areas of Southern Italy um, uh, had the, the opportunity to, um, to get uh, uh, um, larger pieces of real estate where they could settle and build cities there as well. Uh, so, and when that happened, um, the, Rome, the people of Rome noticed that these Greek-like settlements were beginning to invade uh, Southern Italy. And, uh, and so, um, so that is how um, the Romans. The Romans were, you know, one of these groups of peoples around the Tiber River. So in the middle part of the Italian peninsula, they were beginning to, um, to absorb many of the ideas of, of the Athenians. Um, and so what we have is, for example, um, back, going back to the story of uh, the uh, Etruscans, um, it seems that there was a, a kind of coup d'etat among the Etruscan culture and, um, and, and the people who took over uh, started a proto-democracy uh, in, in, in what was the uh, Etruscan territory. Tuscany. Yeah, in Tuscany. Yeah, so um, so um, so what we we don't get a lot from the Etruscans because they didn't write a lot for us. We don't have a lot of writing. We have um, we have kind of scratching on pots, uh, but not really full. Uh, actually, there there's a gold plated um, uh, uh, a gold plated um, uh, leaf of like some sort of writing in it. And we don't really know about it because we don't know a lot about it. And a lot of, a lot of uh, people who, who work in, in, um, in uh, Tuscany, um, they look for, you know, uh, especially um, things that had writing on them. Well, a moment on language. 
Yeah. So I take it that uh, the Tuscan language was different than the Roman language. Yes. <clears throat> and they were both different from the Greek language. Yes. And when the Greeks came over and settled the, um, you know, what the uh, east coast of uh, the Italian peninsula as well as Sicily, they were speaking Greek. But those communities were like colonies of Greece. Exactly. They colonized yeah. southern yeah. Italy. Yeah. yeah. So, so when you uh, go back uh, archaeologically and look for writings from the from the Tuscan Etruscans, um, th there's a it's a language issue as well. Uh, right. It's not it's not going to be as simple as looking for old old Roman lettering, which which we have a certain amount of uh, expertise in these days. Um, I don't know about Greek. It's Greek to me, um, but um, yeah. the Etruscan well, may be a little a little more difficult, no? Yeah, there, there. You know, a, a few decades ago, people thought of the Etruscans as this mysterious culture, um, but it probably wasn't. Um, I, I think that the um, most uh, recent um, theories about the Etruscans were that they they were they were from uh, Anatolia, that is Turkey today. And they got on their ships and they sailed, you know, just like the Greeks were sailing. Um, and, and they planted their culture there, but we don't have a lot of their writing, unfortunately. Do you think, the, you think their language was uh, similar to, to Turkish at the time? No, no, Turkish is completely different. It's a yeah. completely different, um, it's a, an Altaic, um, language, which is like Mongolian and things like that. So, yeah. So, so but what I heard you say, though, is, is that is that the yeah. the uh, Etruscans up there in the hills uh, all had their own version of small community democracy before the Romans did, and uh, uh, and that somehow passed from the Etruscans yeah. to the Romans. No, no, no. That's that's not true because the uh, Etruscans had kings. Actually, there was a federation of, of 12 cities, and each of the cities had a king. Uh, and so that was um, when the Romans began butting against uh, the Etruscan Empire, uh, they, they um, eventually, um, uh, um, with, the, what I, what, uh, with what I mentioned earlier, uh, the rape of the the um, of of the wife of the uh, king Tarquinius Superbus who came uh, to the Roman area, and you know I mean these are just uh, again stories, but but it it shows that there was some sense of grievance between that border along the Tiber River. And so the um, the the it, um, the Romans uh, uh, who were um, dominated by the Etruscans, they then began to try to fight back, and they did eventually. Um, and so the Romans, as they, their populations were growing, and as the Romans were beginning to develop more advanced. Um, uh, 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 battle plans um, that then pushed the Etruscans further away. So um, the Etruscans gave to the Romans, and the Romans took it, and and they stay. And they and and when you see in the backdrop there, those were the Flamines. These were the the um, priests that really came that descended from the um, from the. Um, Etruscans. So, so Rome, they, bec they became part of the Roman Empire then? They were merged into the Roman Empire? It's not really, we're not really talking about the Roman Empire. We're talking more about the Roman Republic. Let's talk about the Roman Republic instead of the Roman Empire. The Roman Republic, as um, scholars of ancient history uh, call it, um, the Roman Republic was the nascent um, civilization of Rome. Later on, there would be a Roman Empire, and that Roman Empire um, built itself uh, through uh, 
uh, capturing all of these hillbillies on, uh, in, in the Italian peninsula. Um, and the Romans got to be really good at fighting. Um, they also had um, a great farmland. I mean, if you've, go, if you've gone to Tuscany, you can, you know, take my word for it. Very rich farmland because it's, uh, it, it's, um, it's uh, volcanic soil, right? So, so that's where, you know, people just, you know, are, a, are able to graze all over and, and, you know, and, and use our agriculture all over uh, Italy. And it was very easy for them. And so the Romans, um, again, they had a de demographic boom. They brought armies to these hillbillies in, in Umbria and, and all those places um, that, that you probably see in all the movies and stuff. Um, and so uh, what happened was that, you know, once the Romans began to figure out the system, um, they could uh, push out all these other tribal peoples and then they would consolidate um, uh, the, the peoples um, by offering a kind of, um, kind of contract. Um, so there were a lot of different cultural groups and the, uh, and the Romans, when they defeated their enemies, um, they brought their defeated enemies into their system was very um, clever. Um, the Romans chose to uh, offer um, uh, perks in exchange for peace. Well, this was um, a matter of expansion, wasn't it? It was a matter of um, building an empire. And they probably used that in all of their adventures uh, up, through, up through pretty much all of uh, Europe. And uh, I just wonder what motivated them. You mentioned before that in those days, it was largely about geography. Uh, what, what motivated the Roman people, the Roman culture, the Roman civilization in Rome to acquire so much territory? They, they got to be everywhere. What, what was driving them? What was driving them? Good. Okay, so um, there was a rival empire uh, called the, uh, the Punic Empire. It was on the coast of North Africa, and that um, and and the Pun the Punic Empire uh, was originally from the Levant, so the Eastern Mediterranean. So there was there was a group of colonists from North Africa or from from uh, Tyre and Beirut, um, and they were doing the same thing that the Greeks were doing. And so um, the, the uh, uh, Phoenicians and or, or the Romans called them the Punics, um, they, uh, uh, they um, created another empire that in Spain in particular, uh, Spain had rich min mineral deposits, um, which made the, the um, Phoenicians very powerful. Um, they had ships just like the Greeks did, um, and the Romans didn't really have, they did not have ships. They were land lovers until the Romans realized that they had, that, that the uh, Phoenicians were going to go take over the, their new kind of um, nascent um, uh, empire. And so they then decided that they needed to wipe out the Phoenicians. Uh, and so the- um, So in a way it was defensive or was, competitive. It, right, so um, uh, everyone knows from the textbooks, you know, that um, Hannibal, the great uh, 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 general of, um, of the Phoenicians in the Punic War, he brought African elephants to the Alps. And his plan was that he was going to take over Italy. He was because um, the Etruscans were, were waning. The Romans were a little bit not, not 
completely consolidated. And so um, Hannibal took his uh, opportunity to break up um, the, the, um, all of the alliances that the Romans had made with these other peoples. And so um, Hannibal actually is probably the person who, who really shaped um, Italy as it, as it was. So eventually what happened, um, I mean, in the, on the west coast of, of Italy, there's a, a sea that's called the Tyrrhenian Sea. So it's, you know, uh, you know, the French Riviera and then the coast of Spain. And that was kind of a zone of trading and exchange. And, um, and the Romans began to worry that they were going to be taken over. And so eventually, um, the Romans um, uh, uh, began to think of themselves as people who could create their own empire. Um, and that had to do with an amazing moment in the Roman Senate. Um, the Roman Senate, uh, one, one of the uh, senators of the Roman Senate said, we have to learn how to build ships. Um, because if we don't get ships, we're doomed. And so, and, and, and the Romans really didn't even know how to build ships. They, they actually saw a, a shipwreck and, he, and they tried to reverse engineer it. And very quickly, the Romans were able to uh, mount a campaign to, to build these ships. And they got, the Senate got together and said, we're going to do this. We have to do this. And, um, and if we don't do this, um, we're going to be taken over. So, so what, what, I, what, I get, what I get is that um, there's parallel things happening. Yeah. <clears throat> so they, they realize that their own destiny is, uh, is, is uh, uh, in, inter, interlaced with, um, with, with traveling, with making, making territorial grabs outside of Rome, and you can't do that without ships. Um, at the same time, this, this collaborative effort required them to invent a system of management of government, and that management of government, which was, you know, uh, which was focused, that visionary senator created focus, and they stayed focused for a few hundred years, and that gave them a period of time in which they could build an efficient, effective government, namely democracy that would be sustainable. Am I right in all that? Okay, so um, the, um, what happened was that um, in, to be a Roman senator, you had to have um, military experience. That was a sine qua non. Uh, and so the, the you know, um, Rome had a, a boundary that, uh, um, that made sure that no one could bring weapons of war in the city of Rome. But outside the city of Rome, it was fair game. And all these um, men who were ambitious about climbing the, the what was called the Corsa Sonorum, the, the ladder of, um, of honors, that's what it was called. Um, there was, uh, the Senate was very much a, a conglomeration of very ambitious men. And when, um, when a, a general would um, defeat an enemy, that general would get all sorts of laurels and, and recognition. That was how you built your career in Rome. And so, um, so we have both the, the government and we also have the military. Um, and they're woven together. You couldn't climb up the ladder unless you could prove that you could lead an army. Was that, is it, what does this teach us about the relationship of military exploits, military 
conquests, uh, territorial expansion vis-a-vis -vis the perfection, and in those days it was perfection, of the system of government in the Senate. Um, yes, <laughs> okay. All right, this, this is a big story. I'm sorry, we're going you know. It's we, okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, so the, um, so the military strategies were sine qua non. Um, and we also had, um, or what the Romans did is that they um, um, proffered alliances to their defeated foes. So that gave them more power. Uh, and so, um, uh, so the, so the Roman Senate was not just a political, um, a political organ, it was also a military organ. Um, the Senate was the supreme, well, actually I should say that there were two bodies in, the Rome, in Rome. Um, the Senate was one, and originally it was supposed to be the, the most, um, there was the 300 wealthiest men um, who, were, who were supposed to be in the Senate. That was how the, the first kings uh, ordered that. And, and then later on, um, there was also another organ in the Roman uh, government, and that was called um, the um, Centuria Curiata, <laughs> which means the uh, the um, the assembly of soldiers. Is that like the uh, <clears throat> the the House of Representatives? Um, kind of, sort of. Um, all of all of the men uh, in the Centuria um, in in the Centuria uh, Centuria Coriata. I'm sorry, it's um, I'm rolling off these weird words, but um, you could um, the, all all the men in that uh, popular assembly they were all the soldiers because the Romans had to have the um, the they had to have the soldiers be part of the the ideology, right? So, Again, it was making a deal, wasn't it? Yeah, we'll so, bring you in, we'll give you some authority and you'll be you know, loyal to us. Yeah, absolutely. That's what it is. And that and that really put the, uh, the, the idea in the hearts and minds of the Romans um, that they were Romans. And they could, they, they really stood up for, you know, what they were. And, and they were, you know, it's kind of like in, in, you know, some military dictatorships where, you know, people drink the Kool-Aid and, um, and they, uh, they follow the leader. Um, but, but I shouldn't say that. I mean, I, I guess I, I should erase that, but, um, but it was a, um, it was a system, the Senate on the one hand and the soldiers on the other hand. And then there were other um, assemblies <laughs> and I won't go into those uh, at all. But uh, so Rome had these um, moments when they could, um, uh, when, especially in the Centuria, uh, uh, the, the um, military, uh, the Centuria, Media, um, though that was the beginning of, I guess you could say, popular Roman democracy. Okay, hold so, there, hold there, Sandy. Um, I, we're kind of out of time, but I okay, want to see if I can make more time, and uh, you and I will talk about a, another another uh, extension of our discussion. Uh, so for now, I will say aloha, but aloha. Uh, we'll be back. We'll be back shortly and see what we can do about. Uh, continuing this conversation. Very interesting. And we're just now getting to the, the essence of it, just now. Thank you, Sandy Schwartz, a history okay. professor at UH in the classics. We'll be right back. Aloha.
Okay, we're, <clears throat> we made arrangements. We're back. We're back with uh, Sandy Schwartz, a history professor in, in the classics at UH Manoa. And we're talking about um, the origins of democracy from ancient Rome. So we took more time uh, here to extend the show called History is Here to Help. And uh, we're, we're going we're gonna to get right into it um, with, um, you know, the emergence, which we were just talking about, the emergence of democratic systems in Rome. Very interesting stuff, because this is where, in my view, and you can correct me, Sandy, <clears throat> the modern world politically really began. But these guys figured out how to work together. And it was all visionary. And interestingly enough, it was, it was all an extension of the military arrangement in Rome. Um, and so please continue with how these shreds of democratic organization grew and flourished in Rome once they got the notion. Okay, well, I should say, don't be duped by the, the white statues <laughs> in the background. <laughs> um, things were wild in Rome during the Republican period. So when I talk about the Republican period, um, we're talking about, uh, about 350 BCE. Okay, so um, there were a lot, there, um, uh, um, Rome was consolidating Italy, uh, and then Rome built its ships and crossed over to the Mediterranean and went to um, the northern coast of Africa, which was a very fertile area. And it was very important for the grain um, trade. Um, there were other places. Okay, let me let me backtrack. So uh, Italy was growing. The population was growing. Um, the the um, the soldiers were on duty most of the time, um, and that meant that. Uh, the farmers, because farmers are always usually they're usually um, the men who fight on for their lands, right? But um, in as as the Roman Senate pushed for more and more warfare, that meant that the soldiers had to leave their homes. And, uh, and then they would have to go to faraway places like some place like Carthage, for example. Um, so, um, so more and more soldiers had longer tours of duty. And in that time, uh, people would poach on vacant lots. Um, sometimes the families, the women had to work the farm. Uh, there were, um, Sometimes there were slaves, but you know it was hard to um, keep slaves when the when the potter familius wasn't around. Um, so during the this period of what we call the Roman Republic, we see a breakup of of what happened uh, with this militar militaristic society. Um, if, um, in the eastern part of the Mediterranean, um, there were a number of wars that were sparked by Alexander the Great and his um, and his successors. And the and as um, the Senate kept thinking about how great our system is. Why don't we just keep pushing it and expanding our network? And, and um, the, the Romans weren't colonizing um, the Eastern Mediterranean. They were actually going to take away um, some magnificent um, provinces, places. There, for example, Pergamum was one of the great uh, uh, um, um, great kingdoms of, of um, Turkey. It's, and these are all Turkey. Most of the action 
for Alexander the Great's successors is in Turkey uh, and during this period. So at the time, though, Greece was pretty active. Gre it was very active. What had happened was that Alexander the Great went on his expedition to the east. Uh, a lot of people came and followed after him. Some people never came back to Greece. Um, but but there were Romans, of course, um, who who you know could fill in the hole, right? They could um, they they could move to these areas, um, and um, and you know there were there were a lot of um, moving parts. Did they eclipse him? Did they eclipse uh, you know the Greek uh, move move into move to the east? Yeah. Well, um, the the um the exploits of alexander the great um there were there were towns actually there were i think the count was that there were 27 cities named alexandria um after uh, alexander's conquests um the most important um part of the mediterranean for the Romans was um, Alexandria. Now, Alexandria was a kingdom. Uh, it was the Ptolemaic kingdom of, uh, created by Ptolemy, who was one of the um, successors of Alexander the Great. Okay, um, um, maybe we should uh, say- no, I, just, I just want to get a relative, a relative mm -hmm. picture okay, of whether so the Romans were becoming more powerful, uh, supplanting Alexander, supplanting Greece, or whether they um, were operating at the same time? What was quite, the dynamic there? Okay, so the dynamic was the Romans saw an opportunity to go um, attack some of the weaker kingdoms. Um, so for example, Macedonia was one of them. Um, and so um, the Romans, uh, uh, went across the, Adri the Adriatic Sea and they came and they took over Macedonia. Now Macedonia was the kingdom of Philip, Philip II and his son, uh, Alexander III. So there were some teetering kingdoms in this area, in the Balkans, as you can imagine, you know, it, um, and so the, uh, the, the, um, uh, there was a, um, a general who, um, who uh, requested from the Senate permission to take over Macedonia. And his, his name was uh, Emilius Paulus. And um, he brought his armies across the Adriatic, came to Macedonia, trashed the place that was the, you know, the kingdom of the, of the Macedonians and Philip. Philip at that time was the big man in, in, um, in the Aegean area. But when Aemilius Paulus came to uh, Macedonia, there was no way that the that um, Philip or uh, uh, the Macedonians had no could they could not stop the attack the the Roman sorry uh, they they um, the the Romans came to Macedonia and the Roman armies were so skilled they were so well trained. Um, that they, um, bit by bit, any kingdom that they could get their hands on, they would take everything apart. So Macedon was one of the first kingdoms that the Romans came to. When you take, uh, when you say take everything apart, do you they mean the they, sack it? Literally, or, you know? they, they, they took everything they could. Did they and, rebuild it? Did they rebuild it? Did they make a deal with the remaining population? Did they remake it in the Roman image? Um, eventually, yeah, they would. Yeah, they would do that later on. But 
But in the first blow, when Emilius Paulus came to Macedonia, um, he, he and his army um, uh, uh, took all the spoils of Macedonia and they brought them all back to Rome. Emilius Paulus was the first man to get a triumph. Triumph wasn't, I mean, we talk about triumphs casually, but for the Romans, the triumph was the most, or for any ambitious general, a triumph was what they wanted. Um, they wanted to be seen as a king, as a, as a god. Uh, and it was like a ticker tape parade in Rome when Aemilius Paulus brought all the spoils of war into the, war, uh, uh, the, the forum. Um, the people of Rome were, um, were, were waving and shouting and showing how glorious um, the Romans were, that the Romans did it as the Roman soldiers, the Roman Senate, and the Roman generals. And um, Aemilius Paulus got, um, he, he got permission from the Senate to have a triumph. Now, um, a triumph was a parade. Um, all, the, uh, all the soldiers came marching in to Rome. Uh, they uh, brought all, the, the, all of the stuff that they could take. Um, that made Aemilius Paulus one of the richest men in Rome. And I think that that was the first of the triumphs. And then afterwards, of course, you know, you have a Senate. A Senate is um, a, an aristocracy that has a lot of um, competition among, among themselves. Uh, and people started wanting their own triumphs. How are you going to get your own triumphs? You know, you, it's like trying to get to be the top dog in, in Rome. Uh, you get it by getting, you know, permission to send an army someplace. You have to convince the members of the, of the Senate that that would be a good idea. And, and, and before you knew it, there were a lot more people who got to be very, very, very rich. Well, this doesn't sound very altruistic. It sounds, it sounds self-interested um, and it sounds very competitive within the members and, and highly political within the members of the Senate. So query, are we on the upswing here in terms of developing Rome? Uh, as a, a, a fair-minded democratic, um, you know, country, uh, empire, um, where, you know, they were, um, they had a morality and ethic doing the right thing, or was it on the downswing? Had they already, you know, crested and were they coming down into this? Uh, comp yeah. Yes. <laughs> I mean, the, 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 the answer is yes. I mean, the, uh, uh, um, and then we move um, towards the end of the, the, um, of the Roman Republic, where then there were social problems, a lot of social problems in the city of Rome. And most of that had to do with the fact that um, they couldn't feed the population. So the Romans, um, uh, the Romans were buying grain. I mean, they had, they needed grain. That was what kept Rome growing because at this time there were no more uh, farmers. Um, and so people gravitated toward the city of Rome. And so the senators would, you know, pass a law, a grain law, and they would say, okay, you know, I am now going, or next Tuesday, I'll be in the forum and I will give all you people um, uh, grain to eat. And, and that was kind of a way of getting, you know, Butcher saying, you know, this, you know, people who had grain and who could 
um, kind of get the crowds together. At this time, Rome was a very large city and there were a lot of people, desperate people in Rome. And so there would be grain shipments and people, you know, and people who were wealthy, they would, they would try to, you know, make sure that everyone knew that so-and-so was, so was giving them the grain. But it was a giveaway though. They, there was no quid pro quo. It was a giveaway because, the, you know what the quid pro quo was? It, it was votes. Mm. Um, so the members of the Senate um, who, were, who were ambitious, um, they would try to get food for votes, or votes for food, however that is. I mean, they didn't care. They needed food. Their, their families needed there's food. There's a corruption in all of that, isn't there? Yes, there is. There was, yeah. But, you so, know, it, it wasn't, you know, the, the Senate, you know, the laws of the Senate weren't completely um, uh, uh, straightened out yet. Um, and what the problem was, was that, you know, when you have a hungry populace in a big city, you know, there, there's a lot of desperation. Uh, and, and so the, so there were other um, assemblies, you know, there were many different assemblies in Rome, um, but there, there were some people who began to, um, criticize the Senate, that the Senate wasn't doing its job. And instead, you know, they were gallivanting in the East, right? And so, um, so the, the Senate wasn't doing its job and the Senate being a, an aristocratic assembly, you know, didn't really connect to people who were the common people. It's kind of like the French Revolution almost, you know, where, you know, you don't care about, you know, whoever's sick, but then, you know, whoever is hungry. But, you know, some people, you know, were, were fine with, you know, giving free food or give, giveaways, as you say, uh, as you said, Jay. Um, and so there was, there were mobs in, in, in the Roman Forum. Uh, there were people um, who would, you know, who, there was corruption, you know, they would, they would tell people to go to the assembly tomorrow and maybe you'll get some food or a sandwich or something. Um, and, and that was how many people in Rome subsisted. It was, a, it was a real problem. There were two factions, there were two factions, one was called the uh, optimates, which were the, the betters, and the populares, which were the popular party. So there started to become this factionalism. And people who, had, who were opportunistic would drive a wedge in between um, the, the different factions. So uh, uh, I guess I asked the same question again. This demonstrates as this is, these are badges of decline uh, relative to the way it had come up. Now it was um, on the way down, um, and it did not it did not bode well uh, when you have this uh, divisiveness, when you have this corruption. Um, this is a big problem. So where where is democracy? At this point in time, I, 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 I guess what I hear you saying is that at some point um, they reached an apex and it was as dem democratic as it was going to get. It was altruistic. It was uh, let's take care of the people, um, you know, as a, as, a, as a charitable matter. And then after a while it de declined. Um, and then I guess what I would conclude that it was not as democratic uh, at some point it, it declined. So when was that? I guess all these factors are working in that direction, but, but when was that and what was the ultimate effect? I mean, we, we're talking about a long slide in which Rome, the empire of Rome ultimately disappears. Is, are we talking about that now? 
Um, well, it's um, okay. We can. Um, so let me let me talk about Caesar Augustus and maybe Julius Caesar. Everyone knows Julius Caesar was stabbed in the Senate. Um, when uh, Julius Caesar died, he he only had one heir, and his name was Octavian. He was adopted um, posthumously by Julius Caesar. Um, uh, Julius Caesar at that time had control over France. And, and he also um, built a very loyal army in France, uh, and Gaul, which is uh, France today, Gaul then. Um, and he, he um, began to um, build his empire, his personal empire in Gaul, whereas um, his um, son-in-law, whose name was um, Pompey the Great. Um, you can see how, how the Pompey the Great, always the Great, you know. Uh, but Pompey, um, uh, Pompey um, snuggled up with the Senate. So he was with the Senate. Uh, Julius Caesar was in Gaul. And um, uh, Crassus uh, was in the Middle East. And he also was in uh, southern Italy. Um, so there were there were a lot of social wars in in the Roman Republic. And as the Roman Republic began to fall apart, um, the the three triumvirs, the three men, got together. The three richest men in Rome got together and divvied up. Um, the, the, the empire, I guess we can call it the empire now. Uh, and, and these were, um, uh, it was a cooperation. Uh, there, was, um, there was the first triumvirate, um, which was when Julius uh, Caesar died. And then the second triumvirate was when um, August, uh, Octavian took over uh, with Mark Antony and, um, and I've forgotten the third one, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, so um, so these, um, these very powerful, very wealthy men were like giants. Like, you know, if you think about in the United States, you know, these, um, these humongous, um, corporations, you know, that that's what the triumvirate was like. Um, it was in a, a funny way, you're drawing a parallel for me mm -hmm. on, to Cosa Nostra in the same way. You divide up the territory, uh, you make a deal, uh, you can get this part of it, I can get that part of it, and you yeah. rule ultimately by, by, by threat and violence. Right, that, that is right, yep. Yeah, like the Cosa Nostra, yeah. yeah. But, but this was really serious because there were, you know, militaries or armies all over um, the Eastern Mediterranean. And so eventually what happened, uh, 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 Julius Caesar and his uh, son-in-law, Pompey, um, they, they uh, had a, a large battle um, in uh, southern Macedonia, um, Julius Caesar won, um, and Pompey uh, lost. Um, Pompey fell into the hands of one of the Ptolemaic kings, and he uh, um, bestowed this prize. <laughs> um, uh, to um, Julius Caesar, because it seemed that Julius Caesar was going to be the last man standing. And so um, one of, uh, one of Pompey's, uh, no, Pompey's henchmen um, uh, brought the head of Pompey to, um, to Julius Caesar, when Julius Caesar had a a short dalliance with the queen of Egypt, Cleopatra. 
And we've seen that in Technicolor in all the movies with, you know, <laughs> the Taylor. Um, uh, uh, so, um, and, and, but, but Alexandria was, was the key to pacifying the Roman um, people in Rome to feed it, to get to feed them. So Julius Caesar wanted, um, wanted food. He wanted an arrangement so that he could have, um, he could be able to feed the people. And if he can feed the people, he can win over anyone else. Yeah, it's, it's a really kind of, it's a difficult um, timeline and it's very, um, very complex. But you know what? It sounds uh, just on that on the four corners of that. It sounds unsustainable because they had left the uh, the landscape outside uh, the city. Uh, they conglomerated in the city. Um, it doesn't sound like there was a, a middle class. It, was, it sounds like people who were waiting for that for that um, that feed that 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 um, the wheat that yeah. coming from other way. So you <clears throat> you require geographical domination in order to feed your own people. How sustainable then can that be? And your own people are not capable of feeding themselves. So you are completely dependent on these emperor soldier people um, to dominate other places. It sounds, it sounds like that dynamic cannot last very long. Yeah, yeah, no, it can't. It can't at all. So what happened next? Um, Julius Caesar dies after um, the battle with Pompey. And, uh, and then um, uh, his, um, his, uh, his um, nephew, his name was Octavian, his adopted nephew, um, he then takes over all the riches and privileges that he had as a general. I mean, one of the top generals. Um, uh, Augustus uh, took a, took uh, start. He took a play, uh, the playbook from Julius Caesar, and um, but he inherited a very volatile situation in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, Mark Antony was trying to get help from the. Persians. Um, Cleopatra was a, a, um, potentially someone who would uh, go with Julius Caesar. And um, Mark Antony just botched it all. Um, and uh, Julius Caesar ended up taking um, most of the prizes. And they botched it up. Uh, Mark Antony botched it up. Um, because he, um, he tried to have a naval battle at a place called Actium, which is on the west coast of, of, um, of Greece. And, um, and during that battle, Cleopatra turned around and went back to Alexandria and she left her lover hanging. And so Mark Antony was kind of out of the equation. Julius Caesar was still there. Cleopatra was still there. Um, uh, Cleopatra had that dalliance. She had two, um, she had one son who's named Caesarion, and, he, and she also had two children by Mark Antony. But of course, once, uh, once, uh, um, uh, once, let me think about this. I have forgotten about the, the, what happened to the children. Uh, eventually, um, the, um, I think, yeah, I was studying it, You know, it, it, all, it all sounds like the stuff of which good movies or interesting movies yeah, are made. Yeah, I know. It's, it's, and it's somebody, somebody wrote it down and it carried a couple thousand years and Hollywood picked it up and, um, you know, from from what you say, this is the movies are at least in a, in a rough outline. They're they're an accurate um, you know uh, re yeah. remembrance of of what was going on. And I can imagine the local people in Rome were all captivated by hearing these stories come back from the front. 
um, oh, yeah. about all the machinations and, and the successes. And, and this must have built a kind of nationalism or reinforced a kind of nationalism. But at the same time, query, you know, were they being properly represented? Could you say that with all these fellows out there dominating and sending wheat back, um, that uh, or bringing wheat back and spoils back, was, was this a representative democracy? Or was this just a bunch of guys pushing each other around? Um, well, okay, so what happened was that um, Augustus Caesar ended up with, the, with all the prizes. And, he then, and then after this uh, dynamic period where there were different wars, um, Augustus Caesar um, managed one way or the other, he was 18 years old when he got the, when he inherited um, Julius Caesar's fortune and his name too. Um, and so, um, so Caesar or Augustus or I'm sure Octavian um, began to consolidate. And, you know, there were people who were like, Mark Antony was out of the picture um, Julius Caesar was out of the picture. He would, August, uh, Octavian was basically the, the last man standing. And he began to consolidate. Um, he, uh, of course, bribed a lot of people. There was a lot of bribery going on. Uh, and, um, and over the course of his life, Octavian, later he was called Augustus, um, he, he rebuilt Rome. In fact, you know, if you see most of the Roman remains in the, in the Forum of Rome, most of those were, were built in, um, as a dedication to um, uh, Augustus. Augustus, um, after all of these wars, um, people needed a respite from the um, commotion in Rome. And, and Augustus gave that to the people of Rome. And it made people feel that there was someone driving the, the, the car. <laughs> Um, and that, you know, that people could maybe get some continuity in, you know, their living positions. Augustus came to be the one man standing and he lived for many decades. Um, so we, we, when we talk about the Augustan period, this is the period when the uh, social unrest of Rome kind of came to stop. It was, it was managed better. And it was managed particularly because Augustus made sure that he had all the grain. You gotta give him credit for that. He was a, a, a positive leader. Um, he was. And, uh, but at the same time, uh, I, would, I would imagine that as he got more powerful and more beloved by the people, uh, the Senate lost power. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. and the, the Senate became ineffectual. So that <clears throat> at a, at a, at a, there must have come a time when he was out of power and um, somebody else took over or tried to take over. And that was a recipe because, because the Senate was no longer functional. And so you don't have a government. Am I right? Right, you don't have a government. Um, the, the, the senators who were in the Augustus's Senate were handpicked. There were no elections or anything. I mean, there were there could be staged elections, but they didn't mean anything because Augustus had all the cards. So here we are, uh, and it's, it's it's ripe for a fall, and it does fall. Um, and yet, a couple of things. Uh, one is that it left such a huge mark on Europe and the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, even in describing it, Sandy, 
you've used a number of Latin terms. And it's not because that's an essential way of describing it, but because that is in our language um, and the language all over Europe and therefore all over the world. And so these guys had more of an effect on human civilization than, than you could shake a stick. Um, and I guess in, in a funny way, they also had an effect on democracy, um, except I, I, it seems like it's elusive because although they had a Senate, although they had the army as a kind of house of representatives, I, I haven't heard yet, maybe you can help me, um, how this was a democracy that, that would influence democracies using the term democracies, um, you know, so in, you know through, the, through the millennia that followed. Uh, it doesn't sound like, it sounds like their aspirations for a democracy are greater than their actual contributions. What are your thoughts? Right. Um, um, the Roman army was a very important social phenomenon. Um, you know, the, I mean, we, those are the guys who went out, um, you know, conquering all these territories. Um, and we sometimes don't get like, you know, the, um, the down to earth um, life that they had. Um, but throughout um, Western Europe, um, you can find fragments of what the Roman soldiers in the army, the Roman army left behind. Uh, there's, uh, for example, there's a, in England, there's a, um, a museum about that has shoes of Roman soldiers and women's shoes and uh, uh, shoes of children. Um, because when the, it wasn't just the Roman soldiers who were marching across um, the, the continent, it was also the families that were trailing behind. Roman, Roman um, soldiers weren't allowed to get married, but you know, that's not gonna happen, you know? So, so there were lots of men or, or women and children we're going back. And so I, um, the, the Roman army really created what we know as, as, as um, Western Europe. Because wow. the Roman army had that stand that it had its uh, cookie cutter approach all over, um, uh, all over Europe. And you can see it from, you can see it in, in, um, in North Africa, you can see it in Spain, you can see it uh, in northern Germany. Um, all of that, you know, we see the the the, the importance of these, you know, unknown people. Actually, there many of these people are are known because when they got out of their military service, they were given a diploma. And that showed that they were then full Roman citizens. Yeah. So, so if you look around Europe now, you see a, a common denominator of parliaments, some more um, free thinking than others. Mm -hmm. um, some, some have, uh, you know, just kind of conceded to authoritarian dictators, tyrants to use the term that we discussed in Greece last time. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, I, I don't think that's just coincidence. Uh, I would suggest, and I'm interested in your analysis of this, the fact that they had, they have today parliaments, uh, some, some better than some worse, uh, and voting for people and political parties um, that engage in politics um, and negotiation and compromise. Those are concepts that at least some of them anyway from this discussion were invented in, in the Roman Republic. Am I right? And it's not there a coincidence. A, a window, there was a short window uh, in, in the Roman Republic where things were functioning as we would like to think they, they functioned. 
but it things fall apart and they fell apart in Rome. And, and you know, it, re, it created a new kind of um, empire. Which is, um, empires are nice and they leave long shadows, but the bottom line is that you, you'd rather live in a democracy than an empire. Because I'm sure there's plenty of brutality, atrocities, not only in the far reaches of the empire, we know that, but also in Rome itself. Yeah, um, but if, if you look, so the, um, the image I have is from the Arapacus, the altar of peace. And, the, this, and Augustus had the strength and the power to bring peace together again. Um, now, is there a democracy? I don't think so. I think, I think that democracy in Rome, you know, maybe the democratic um, ideas may become through the army, but you know, army soldiers don't necessarily sit down and try to um, write any constitutions. Um, you know, the um, I don't think Augustus. Um, you know, Augustus didn't. You know, he would he would help the people. He would he would stand up. Be, he would be called the Pater Patrias, that is the father of the nation. Some people like it. Some people like the security of that, and I think that's what Augustus brought to the table. And and he was he intended to be altruistic, and he he was altruistic. He and was. it's like it's the it's the. It's the aspiration of humankind, the, the hope of humankind always to have an altruistic leader. You know, hence we have histories of kings even today. Hence we make democracies into authoritarian governments because we're still looking for that altruistic leader. Although it's hard to find it because of the old, the old slogan about how power corrupts. And uh, it's remarkable that uh, Augustus didn't get corrupted over a long, period of rulership. But mm -hmm. I want to ask you the operative question here, though. This okay. is the hard one. <clears throat> How much of that is reflected in the American system, in the American Constitution? Because there were a lot of things that happened in the meantime. You know, the development of Western Europe gave us so much that in, in you know, as, as lessons to learn uh, in the development of our system, uh, our Constitution. Yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, Thomas Jefferson um, read um, uh, uh, the uh, the works of Plutarch in Latin. I mean, there you go. You know, and and he he, um, you know, the 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 concepts that we have from ancient Rome, you know, still live today. Um, well, the other the other thing that um, maybe it lives even stronger today and in the 19th century are the lessons we can learn, uh, the, the seductive lessons we can learn from the decline. Uh, and I suppose that means the decline of uh, Athens and the decline of Rome mm -hmm. um, that we have to be careful, mindful of uh, as we as our great American experiment lurches forward or maybe backward for some people. Um, mm -hmm. So what are those lessons? What are the, what are the things, uh, the decline points, if you will, that we should be careful about uh, that, that have proven to be common denominators for the, the decline of all relatively successful governmental systems? Yeah. Um, well, I guess I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> well, um, I mean, for example, did they really have to? Did they really have to go far and wide to dominate other countries? Was that necessary? Uh, could they have done without it? Could could the human experience have done without it? Uh, could, did they have to bring the people into the cities and um, separate them from agriculture? Did, did they have to do that? Mm -hmm. um, and did they have to, um, you know, essentially dismantle the authority of the Senate? Uh, in favor of of of, of one uh, even altruistic leader, uh, right. have we shown? Have has history shown that that's dangerous business? 
uh, or are we doomed to live it again? Yeah, the other author um, that many of the founding fathers read um, in their schooling um, was uh, was the um, uh, the the speeches of Cicero. Um, Cicero was was not. I mean, he he eventually became part of the Senate. Um, he was considered a, a new man, which meant that he didn't have the kind of um, family ties. Uh, and he, he wrote these speeches during this time period and during the fall of the Roman Republic. And um, he was, a, he was a, a lawyer and, um, and much of what we know about um, Cicero was that he was extraordinarily brave. So there were the, you know, there were of course the soldiers, there were the, the generals, even Augustus. But what we see, what we have now today, what's the most precious thing is are the speeches of Cicero, because he was the one who was laying out a a, a sketch of what um, what Rome should look like. Actually, that. I mean, we could have another uh, session about, about Cicero. He was really laying down the, the principles of what it means to, to live under the law. Because the, the, the triumvirs, they, they had nothing to do with the law, where they would just, you know, kind of, you know, push it off. Um, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's an amazing story, but Ju um, uh, Caesar, I'm sorry, not Caesar, uh, Cicero is, is a, 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 a book that's worth reading because you can see not just a dry legal thinker, but he was a true patriot. I mean, he was willing to lay down his life when he um, when he found a, a, a conspiracy among the Romans, and and it, it would, and we have his words. He even wrote letters to his to his brother and his friend who were living in Athens still. Um, so it, it, we have so much precious writing that. Um, that, that, that we can kind of get a sense of, of how people before us um, were able to kind of scrape together um, a, a system of law that would be fair to the citizens. That's a, <clears throat> that's a fabulous answer and comment to my question, Sandy, <clears throat> because, you know, the Romans did not have a perfect experience, but they had an experience. And you always learn from experience. And what we need is an observer, a fair witness on the experience who can translate all of that into universal lessons. And that's what it sounds like Cicero is. And uh, you make me want to go read him immediately. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because I think- A few I think copies, it, I'll send you some. <laughs> <laughs> because his lessons, you know, it sounds so appropriate, even now, even today, this very day, in terms of courage um, and avoiding corruption um, and avoiding cynicism and, and bringing the, you know, the people back together again for uh, a democratic experience um, with high moral fiber. Um, I really have to, I really have to read it. But also, I would like to have another session with you about Cicero. Okay. Um, and we can examine you know, uh, what he said, uh, why he said it, uh, and what it means, what it has meant over the years, the millennia, and what, and what it means today, right now in the U.S. of A. That would be a really fabulous uh, conclusion to our uh, well, adventure I'm... here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, will, I, will, I will suggest other dates uh, for us to do that. Okay. I, want, I want you to know I really appreciate this is actually 
um, a momentous discussion we have had, very valuable. Oh, and oh, I love it. I love talking about this. You know, <laughs> I'm here anytime you want, we can talk about it. Okay, Sunday. Thank you so much for all, all right. this time and all this, okay. all this so much great information. You take care. All right. Bye, Jay. Bye, Sunday. Thank you. Bye.